I've always been a two culture kind of guy. And Wesleyan introduced me to that other culture, the humanities, which has, has made all the difference. I mean, bioethics is really about the sciences and dialogue with the humanities. And it's a very interdisciplinary field. And to be a humanist without any scientific training or scientific scientist without any humanistic background is to be incapable of making moral choices uh, because they're so complicated. Good facts lead to good, good, to good ethics. Um, so you need to know the facts. You need to be able to understand the science, but the science alone doesn't give you the answer. And I think I learned that relationship in the most you know, personal way. The, the, the journey from Olin Library to the Science Center and back across Church Street, ironically, that has been the journey of my life, making those connections between those, those two pillars of, of understanding, those two libraries. I was a little disappointed by what I encountered in, in modern medicine. It was, it, was, it was less humane, less patient-centered than what I thought it should be. And I try to change it from within. And I thought bioethics was a vector for change as a way to humanize medicine and improve the doctor-patient relationship. And the work that I'm doing now, which I think is the ultimate challenge, I mean, it, it, it stresses me to, uh, to, no, to no end because I really don't know if it's the right thing to do, and it's very complicated. But my group of colleagues at Cornell and I are working with people who have what's called disorders of consciousness, patients who are, who are above the vegetative state, like Karen Ann Quinlan or, or, or Terry Schiavo. But these are patients who are minimally conscious. These people have been neglected, but they have a life of the mind. They're conscious and they're isolated. Um, there's been a recent study that showed that the diagnostic error rate for people who have traumatic brain injury, who've been labeled as vegetative, who are in fact minimally conscious, 41%. Horrible number. So we're trying to study this, this patient population, better characterize them and develop prosthetics for them and, and neuroimaging to better uh, diagnose and perhaps treat them. Um, along the way, we've, we've, uh, we've done the work with the deep brain stimulation. We put electrodes into a patient um, and took somebody who could only communicate by eye movement, now can say six words at a time, um, can say the first 16 words of the Pledge of Allegiance, can eat by mouth before he was totally dependent on a peg tube. Um, he now has choice. He now can express himself. Back to my patient's injury the day she got injured. And I start telling the story. And what's interesting is that you know, when I finished this book, which has been a, you know, a huge uh, challenge to do and to write, you know, the mechanics of all that has been very you know, hard. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm sort of, as I'm doing that, I'm beginning to think of what's the next stage. And I think that, that um, you know, life should be a series of challenges. Um, they all don't have to be intellectual challenges. They can be family challenges. They can be you know, community challenges. They can be service challenges. But I think, we're, I think we're meant to be challenged, and, and we're meant to respond. And I think that's what we were, we were kind of cult acculturated to do that here. You know, stasis is not synonymous with a Wesleyan education. 